What's up? Hey guys, good afternoon. And uh, I'm really, really excited about this one. So let me go ahead and bring out the panelists. We have uh, 2017 grad Elizabeth Rios. What's up? And also uh, 2018 grad Tim Hofius. Hey man, so this is um, really special for me, um, for sure. Uh, in my career, one of the things that brings me the most pride is being a member of one of the strongest employee uh, employment unions, not just in film production, but like on the planet. Uh, one of the leaders in employment unions, uh, the Directors Guild of America. And so um, I um, learned about it when I was a student here. Uh, and had limited kind of resources about uh, how to get in, but um, did my own research, did a deep dive, and uh, found the different uh, paths and uh, kind of uh, picked which way I was going to go. And, um, you know, getting into the union in 2002 uh, remains, you know, one of the highlights of my career, and I will never give up that union membership and even if I'm not working I'm paying my dues so that I can always stay active with that because it's just such a source of pride for me and so uh, you know when I meet when I meet you guys and uh, you know especially when you want to when you're interested in AD, you know, that's really where I can help the most. But that's not the only place I can help. I can help any of you guys that are interested in doing whatever. But obviously when you want to kind of, you know, do, do what I, what I do, uh, that's where I have the most insight and the most information. And so uh, these two grads that are flanking me on the left and right uh, are among the less than uh, 10 since I've been working here in nine years, and so think about how many students I see every month and divide that, uh, multiply that by nine years. And so, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's quite an accomplishment, and I couldn't be more proud of these guys. So uh, they uh, definitely deserve a lot of, of respect. And so uh, actually, uh, before we get started, I'll show you uh, some photos I have of these guys because, you know, we, um, we became uh, buds, and you know that's that's you know I don't know if people are confused about how uh, I get close with certain students or whatever, but it's just a factor of reaching out to me and wanting to get advice and listening to the advice and then doing the advice and then following up and then that's it. Like that's that's how mentorship works. You understand? Like you find people, you ask them for advice, they give it to you, and uh, you know when you follow up and you say that you're taking it and that it works, it's when uh, we go to the next level. And so these guys did that. Uh, starting from you know early on at their time here, and uh, you know it went from you know kind of teacher student to mentor protege to now I mean they're my peers now they're my like colleagues and so let's see. So uh, several years ago, um, my really good friend Greg Pollock uh, credited on uh, episode seven last week and episode eight this week of The Mandalorian as the first AD uh, came through here and visited uh, and he had never seen the, the college and uh, so I gave him a tour. He laughed at me because my picture's on the wall uh, and then I ambushed him with this hand-picked group of uh, five students and uh, you see in the middle there, a much fatter Tim Hofius, uh, but you know, um, and then and there's Kyle Crowder and Sandy Gupta, who's an AD in India, and then uh, next to Greg is Marcos uh, Dominic, who's currently uh, Chris Evans' assistant, and so you know, like there's a through line between those kids that were there, and uh, you know that that must have been close to the time you were getting ready to graduate, maybe towards the end of your time here. Is that yeah, right? Yeah, it was pretty close. And, um, you know, one of the, I'll, I'll also add, you know, one of the coolest things about these guys is that I've, I've hired both of them, uh, you know, to work with me on set when I was ADing various things. And so, uh, you know, one of Elizabeth's first gigs up in Atlanta was on Shaft, uh, you know, maybe like the day after she graduated, she was up there. <laughs> yeah, something you know, like that. Working on that. And then we worked uh, with Steve Barris on the thing out in LA. Yeah. And so, uh, and Tim. Uh, you know, I got to hire him on his very first day ever on the one and only Ivan here in uh, Orlando. And so, uh, you know, that's, that's really special. So I don't know that mo many of you guys are going to get uh, opportunities like that as I don't want to work 
uh, that much anymore, but here's uh <laughs> Oh my gosh. Uh, this is what? like the day that Elizabeth and I met, I think, and it was like over yeah. spring break or something like that, and Frank Jeremiah brought her in and said, hey, this girl wants to AD. It was and Christmas break. It was, yeah, I knew it was like some break. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we had this uh, flat Gary that was, uh, I, that was in my possession for a little while. Weird story, don't ask, uh, you know, but, um, but that that was uh, the kind of the yeah. genesis of our, of our hanging out. Yeah. And so... Yeah. Um, so, you know, so. before we get into the, to, to the DGA stuff, you know, I always like to, you know, reminisce on you guys' time here as students, you know, because that's what these guys are, that's what's in these guys' face. So, mm -hmm. you know, if the formula is, uh, classes and labs and get lots of experience and do a lot of networking, you know, how'd you do with that when you were a student here? Well, I just like, I took every moment I could to go to every single production I could, e even with the busy schedule that I had. So it's like, even if like I had to miss some of like the basic classes, I took absentees to go like get experience working on a production, whether it be a student film or outside of Full Sail doing like music videos and stuff. So it's like, I was just constantly, like I never got any sleep and I was constantly just working. And um, when did you, you know, kind of like, diagnose AD as the thing? So when I first came to Full State, I wanted the direct, like I think a lot of people do. Um, and then I found script supervising. And then I didn't, I was like, ah, eh, maybe not that. And then somebody's like, hey, can I you AD, first AD this music video for me? And I did that and I'm like, wow, like I really like this. And then it was just a deep dive after that. I'm like, I don't want to do anything else. Like I just want to AD. And that's literally the, all I did the rest of my time at Full Sale was AD everything that I could. Uh, so how about you? Like, uh, you know, do you feel like you really made the most of your time when you were here? Um, yeah, it, it, for, for the most part, I think I did. I, uh, I definitely went with the same work your butt off approach uh, type of thing because uh, back then and still now I'm working on like my networking skills and like talking to people and like, you know, putting on the face that we talk about all the mm -hmm. time and, and uh, um, you know, and like introduce myself and sell myself as a, as a person that's like, you know, reliable and I'll be here. So. For me, it was just like getting to as many sets as I could and work as an AD on, and try to like hone those um, those skills of leadership and just talking to everybody all the time and, and getting used to all of these interactions, even though like I always consider myself uh, an introvert. Um, so that, that was truly, truly amazing and truly great. And uh, yeah. So that's, a, I mean, that's like a muscle, you know, that you got to. Yeah. Exercise, you know, you can't just say I'm an introvert. I guess that's it. Like you, no. you know, you can't accept that. You have to work on that. And it's different people have to work on different aspects. But you got to be like well-rounded. And so you can't just say uh, I work really hard, but I'm shy and I can't talk to people. Like you have to, you have to embrace that. Uh, you have to lean into that and improve. And you can, you know, don't just think I'm born this way and I guess I can't uh, be more outgoing. Um, so what about, uh, did you, was AD like on your radar before you came here? No, absolutely not. I didn't know what it was. <laughs> what, were, what did you think that you were coming here to uh, learn to do? I thought it was going to create documentaries and direct. Wow, that's quite a difference. Research and do that kind of stuff. Um, and um, I did give, I, I feel like, while in school, like I gave it a fair shot to like a little bit of everything, and I was like, technology is not my thing, so there goes sound and camera. Um, and uh, I don't know, like I remember a lecture I had where like they described what an AD was, and I was like, yeah, I want to be the person calling Rolling on set. That sounds cool. It's pretty. Cool. And uh, yeah, yeah, and it's like uh, I don't know. It never wore off. It, it's just like I kept doing it, and then I discovered I wanted to do that. And, and like you said, the moment uh, I started manifesting or like, you know, telling people out loud and all of my instructors said I wanted to be an AD and it's like, well, you need to talk to Larry Katz. And I'm like, you mean the Hall of Fame guy that with the picture over there? Yeah, 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 that guy. And I'm like, okay, not cool. Not that scary. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, absolutely not. Not, not that scary. So um, would you say you guys kind of like became go-to ADs uh, amongst the, the different classes? You know, there's, oh, for sure. there's kids that, that gravitate to certain yeah. roles and it's like, get, we got to get them. We got to get Elizabeth. We got to get Tim. Yeah. yeah. So did you guys? De I definitely became like, especially in my class and like the classes ahead of me, I became like the go-to like, you know, person like, hey, like Marcos was the only one further ahead of me that was like the other one. So it's like, you know, me and Marcos were just, you know, back and forth between working on projects, you know. 
Was it competitive or were you guys? Uh, we were cool. Like, you know, if I like was the first on something, I'd bring Marcos on, like either second or second, second with me and that kind of stuff. Marcos will be here for a uh, panel someday. Uh, he's just uh, amazing and cool dude and everybody loves him. So, um, so let's talk about, you know, getting ready to graduate and picking where you're gonna live. So, uh, you know, when did you start thinking about that and, uh, you know, how'd you pull the trigger? <laughs> Uh, for me, like I always like people were talking about between everybody kept on saying go to LA, but I was like I was hearing that Atlanta was starting to pop off, like you know slightly, slightly before I graduated. And I'm like you know what, me and a couple of friends groups were like yeah we're moving up to Atlanta, like they want to go to Atlanta. I'm like cool, that sounds good to me. I'm like you know I knew a PA that was moving up there for a show, so I was like okay that's I have a connection up there, so it's like it might be more worthwhile for me to head up there, and that's what I ended up doing is going to Atlanta straight after graduation. Like really, like literally like, right two after. days after graduation. Wow, that's cool. How about you? Oh yeah, like you don't know that. <laughs> Um, so, um, I, it had been maybe a month or two since I had graduated and, uh, you and I had a conversation about what are you doing with your life? Uh, why are you still in Orlando? And, uh, and I was like, well, I don't know anybody anywhere. And it's like, that's not an excuse. And, uh, um, at the time I was going through a situation where like I was in between places and like couch surfing and whatnot. Um, and uh, we had this conversation, I, I don't know, and he's like, okay, how, how are you doing? Like, are you tied to Elise? Are you doing this and that? And I'm like, no, actually all my stuff is packed up in my car right now. <laughs> and, uh, and you said, okay, you have no reason to just go couch surf in Atlanta. I'm gonna be there, uh, and this is a direct quote, I'm gonna, be, <laughs> I'm gonna be out there shooting a movie the next month, and maybe if you're out there and you have your stuff together, uh, maybe I'll come on and, and, and you know, you, we'll have you come work for a day there. And I'm like, okay, yeah, whatever. And uh, 30 days after that, um, I found a couch to, it, through Frank Jeremiah. He, um, he, he introduced me to you and he put, he connected me with another full cell grad who was kind enough to have me over for a month and we ended up being friends, uh, really good friends after that. And uh, yeah, and that's how I ended up on my first day on set in, uh, son of Shaft with this guy. Um, fun times. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's a, I, I, there's a, it's a pattern among some students. Maybe they're here in Orlando and they graduate and you've had a job, you know, outside of school and, uh, you know, your bank account looks pretty bleak. And so some students will say, well, I'm just going to save up some money for a couple of months and then I'm going to move. And so, you know, I, I understand that, but you know, you have some, uh, you know, inertia, you know, that is like a body at rest stays at rest, a body in motion stays in motion. So when you graduate, it's like you have some momentum. And to say, I'm going to stay here and save up some money, you know, to me, first of all, no, you're not. You're living paycheck to paycheck. And so you're yeah. just going to stay here and live paycheck to paycheck. And you're not going to save any money. So, you know, that's, a, that's not the way that that seems to work. And secondly, it's like you lose all of your momentum. And so especially... Uh, somebody like Elizabeth, who, I mean, obviously had so much potential and, like, uh, was kind of ready to launch, you know, um, and there's been a couple other noteworthy students that I had the same conversation with and basically said, get out of Orlando. Like, I'm kicking you out. And, you know, we were sitting in the, uh, in the office in 4A and we're having this conversation. I'm like, just go find a couch. And Frank from over the other side of the bullpen was like, I got a couch that you can crash on. And that's exactly how that happened. And so like Excellent. sight unseen, not even knowing this person, uh, she went and moved. And so that is uncomfortable. That is awkward. That is not the way that you would draw it up. But you have to take these uh, opportunities and do things uh, in the name of uh, you know it's hard to get started doing this and so sometimes you got to do stuff like that and I mean this guy uh, you know you want can we talk about yeah, your situation over yeah. here I mean uh, and I didn't even know it until maybe after he graduated but you know Tim was homeless when he was yeah. Going to like, school here and stayed in the in Spo, like lived in Spo. Crouched couch surf, stayed at you know slept in like chairs if I could. Cause I didn't have a car like when I was here. 
And so it's like, you know, that's I chose to take the film industry and like the path of finishing my degree and getting as much experience as I could and working because it's like, you know, I got fortunate. Larry brought me on towards the end of my you know time here. And then I just kind of trickled down of like, you know, continued getting paid work. And I'm like, cool, like this is actually going to work. So I'm like, I'll just hang out either, you know, at the school or crash on somebody's floor somebody's couch and I'm like save up as much money as I can so that way I can just move straight up to Atlanta and that's what I did me and a buddy of mine packed all of our belongings into the back of his Jeep and moved on up and I spent like a thousand of my savings to get a car the next day when I was up in Atlanta and was working a week later so. and I mean you know so some of you guys were in my panel this morning and you know I, I hope that through the course of talking to grads you're seeing this kind of pattern that there that there's struggles at the beginning of your career like everybody uh, has yeah. that like it's not yeah. like you just launch and it's like rainbow unicorns and everything it's like hard it's it's and gonna be a wait, there's coaster. rainbows yeah. and yeah. unicorns yeah. <laughs> no, when are you gonna see those you know no, soon, no. soon. <laughs> like... where's the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow <laughs> so um so you, you you got your first job your yeah. first couple of days here in Florida you know um and I was happy to and I, I mean I still uh, remember the look on your face and Kyle's face and Holly's face. I got to hire four. I think they were still students, you yeah. know. And uh, and this was a big Disney movie with all the stuff, you know, uh, cranes and cars and period cars and Brian Cranston. And I remember uh, the look on these guys' faces and their eyes were so wide and I, it was so fun. So, uh, but then when you moved up to Atlanta, how did you uh, get work? So I texted one of the PAs that was on Ivan uh, down here in Orlando because well, she was telling me on another show. She's like, hey, I'm going up to Atlanta. Uh, here is so, so, so. And I'm like, cool. And she's like, I'll be up there around this time. And she's like, cool, text me when you're on your way up. I texted her one as soon as I was like heading up to Atlanta. And she's like, cool, uh, are you available to start working this date? And I got to go. I'm like, yeah. And then I started as an additional PA on that show. And then they liked me. The 80s over there liked me. So I got brought in as an everyday additional on Dr. Sleep. I mean, that was my first job in Atlanta, you know, just right out the gate. Like, I consider myself extremely fortunate because it's like not everybody gets that opportunity, but if you do put in the work, like, you can have that opportunity. You know, it's just all about networking and connecting with the right people. It is who you know, and that's going to play a big factor, but if you talk to enough people and you show that you are, you know, worthy and work hard, they're going to hire you. They're going to recommend you to people. That, you know, he said a, a real um, key word that you guys gotta know like when you're first starting out you gotta be aiming in the right direction and so uh you know so i've talked about it with some of you guys in class and stuff but you know when i start a movie i get to build my team my staff every department has their core staff that's going to be with us every day whether we're a small day on stage or a big giant day in camping world stadium or whatever and so uh you know your first day that you graduate you're you're not qualified for that like i need people that have experience i don't i can't be a teacher when we are shooting and we are like shot out of a cannon on a treadmill that's going 5 million miles an hour and so it's unrealistic and kind of inappropriate for you to say I want to be a staff PA the day that you graduate and so the magic key word that he said that makes you sound like you know what you're talking about is hey I just graduated I'm looking for additional PA days additional PA days are we need 40 people to stand three and a half miles away from the camera and like lock up a homeless guy and a rat or something yeah. like that and yeah. you guys are Deep qualified woods. Yeah. for that yeah. right now okay so that's a that is to say that uh kind of to the person you're talking to resonates as you kind of know what you're talking about you know that you're asking the right question uh what about you so shaft uh, that t that ended up me being more than just a day, right? You were with us for a couple weeks. Uh, yeah, I think so. That first day, uh, it, it was like a you know a random day on stage, but Samuel L. Jackson was there, guys. It was crazy. <laughs> I was like, what is happening right now? Um, but it was the last day of Christmas. I remember because I had come back to Orlando already for the Christmas break. And it was maybe December 21st or something like that. And this guy calls. Finally, and and you know, uh, on his promise of like bringing me one day to set, and he goes like, "Hey, so are you available tomorrow?" And I'm in Orlando, um, and I was like, uh, "Yeah, totally." And I said, "Babe, I'll see you the day after tomorrow." And I 
went and I'd like turned the car around and I and I uh, went back to Atlanta. I, I don't know. I got on. I, I got there like 11 p.m. and I had to be uh, on set on the set of Shaft at uh, six in the morning uh, so that I could be on time to bring coffee to Mr. Jackson. It was so amazing. <laughs> it's like uh, super crazy. And then um, I don't know. It was a. It, you know, like I'm immensely grateful for that day, of course. And um, it just like it's the thing that got things kickstarted. Um, I met the PAs, and like sometimes when you have additional days or additional PA days, the key PA will take on the role of like booking those. Oh yeah, this day and this day will um, um, will need additional. So the key PA is a good position person to like uh, spot out in, in mm -hmm. a room, or the second second AD, the key second AD will will take on that job. So usually, you know, you find those people and you network with them. I had no idea. I just like, you know, hit it off with like these people. <laughs> and, uh, um, and then the key PA said, hey, um, are you available January 8th, like when we come back from the break? And I was like, yeah, yeah, totally. And then this guy is making the premium <laughs> for, for uh, the, pre the preliminary call sheet for that first day in January. And he's like, why are you here? I didn't approve this. And I was like, you don't need to, man. And uh, after that, it was like, OK, can you come in like next week, another two days, another three days? And I ended up wrapping the show uh, and just kind of becoming a, a small part of the crew. It was uh, it, it was pretty cool. And after that, I, I had been working on or like supplementing my work with like with um, uh, reality TV and stuff because that's some of the work that I did before I got into scripted and then after that show I never went back to reality I just you know stayed with scripted which is what I wanted to do to like work on my days to get my days and get in the union eventually um, and that's what happened and I just kept working through the same people I met on shaft and then I met somebody else on the <coughs> next show and somebody else on the next show and and it just keeps going it's like a snowball I hadn't um, met the key PA that we ended up hiring on shaft you know we we interviewed people and uh, we met this kid and he's just amazing great 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 guy and so uh, you know him and I um, developed a great working relationship on set and you know when I said uh, you know but they and everybody on the crew knew that I worked at Full Sail also and I mean it's pretty interesting all the crew members they wanted to know about that oh my gosh you're a teacher do you like it is it cool how can I do that can I get off set and be a teacher it's it's uh, it's really a, uh, a popular yeah. uh, topic of conversation when yeah. I'm working on set and everybody wants to know about working at Full Sail and so um, you know when I told uh, John Blanford the the key PA uh, that I wanted to bring uh, Elizabeth on, you know, he, I think he knew that meant that she had been trained up by me uh, on how to be a PA on a big movie set. And you know, that's my contribution to you guys. Like I know what a PA is supposed to do on a big movie set. I have no idea what a PA is supposed to do on a commercial or a music video or an independent film or a YouTube channel or anything else. But if we are talking about this one specific corner, uh, obviously, you know, that's my kind of area of expertise. And so, uh, you know, um, Elizabeth was smart enough to uh, put that into action. And so here's John Blanford surrounded by all these other jabronis who we hired from Atlanta who were fine, but she just had, uh, you know, she, she put into action all the things that we had, had practiced and talked about. And so, uh, you know, John Blanford was like, what are you doing next? Uh, I'm like, I'm going back to Orlando, but you go, you go ahead and spread your wings and fly. So um, once you guys got started, um, were you still pretty solid on AD or did you ever, uh, once you got going, because it's, uh, we talked about it this morning, but it's interesting to see you guys sometimes, you know, actually get into this and see what it really is like, because you don't know what it feels like to be on a set like that for, you know, days and days on end and hours and hours on end. And you might not like it and you have to pay attention to that because if you don't like it, then it's going to be like torture, like every second. Yeah. And so, um, did you, so did it solidify that you wanted to do AD or did you ever think of, oh, I might want to do that or this? Um, um, I've definitely, um, had flirted with other ideas, but, um, for the most part, I've just been a hundred percent. This is my, this is my jam. This is my vibe. It's really, it's really my thing. It's where I fit better. Um, 
but I mean, I, I, I don't say no. I've, even within the AD department, I've, I've had different things. I've been like, oh yeah, like I definitely wanna be a first AD as a career. And I'm like, no, I wanna be a second second for the career. No, 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 I wanna be a key. Right now I wanna be a UPM. And, uh, but it's always, it's always changed as I get to know more of the different positions. Cause even within the department, there are like, it's like we have such different jobs. And in a way, they do train you up for the next one, but in a way, it doesn't. Like, they're very completely different. Um, so, I don't know, the more you know, the more you know. <laughs> it's like, um, it's just like staying open, staying flexible, and then, I mean, I don't know, maybe, you know, it's it's crazy. I've, I've uh, like, I've toyed with the idea of, like, second unit directing. I love stunts, blowing th stuff up. It's just mm -hmm. so cool. <laughs> yeah. So it's like, and it's so chill, too. I don't like, yeah, I, I, could, I could do that. But uh, who knows? It's, it's really about where it takes me. And, and like you said, just, like, listening to yourself and your body, your wants and needs and your desires, and just staying true to that. How about you? Uh, I had some contemplation about like 200, 300 days into my PA day. So I'm like, uh, do I really like, I had like one moment where I'm like, do I really want to continue doing this? Cause it's like, you get beat down after doing it for so long and just grinding away. Like, you know, once you start doing your PA days, you're just go, 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 go. And I was just so beat down. I'm like, ah, do I want to do another department? But then I'm like, no, I'm too far in. I enjoy doing this. Um, I have like gone back and forth. Like originally I wanted to be a first, but now it's like, I've come back down to like, I'm, I'm happy being a second, second, like a career second second because it's like you know you get to be on set you know you, you still have responsibility but you don't have to worry about as big of responsibility of like creating the schedule dealing with actors building a call sheet you just I'm you like, don't have to think about it in the yeah. weekends at yep. night like you're yeah. not on call. the weekends are my weekends as long as the pr is done you know yeah. you to go home and enjoy it so uh, a couple things that i want to point out um so tim started talking about days okay and that's another real important buzzword about this, about getting into the DGA, because I would say the most widely traveled path to becoming a DGA member as an AD is collecting days as a PA. And so other positions in other unions may talk about hours or whatever, but if you're talking about DGA, you're talking about days. And it's a, it's a certain amount of PA days, and there is a you know, things about those days uh, that make them count. You know, it can't be a student film, so, uh, and you do have to be able to document, and yeah. uh, you have to be able to back up that you did those days with collecting call sheets and production reports, pay stubs, crew lists. The more documentation that you can collect, the better you can, you know, justify each of them as a qualified day. So don't worry about keeping your full sale call sheets because they do not count. Student film days do not count. And you guys should uh, you know, know about the website, dga.org, and there's lots of information on there. There's another website called DGACA, D-G-A-C-A, DGA Contract Administration, dgaca.org, and that's the one that actually um, has the information about the different paths uh, to becoming an AD. And so, you know, also these guys both, you know, you would think you're, you are going to be, if you want to be an AD, you want to be a first AD because that's the highest position there. Uh, but, you know, that's not necessarily the case. And that's the same for if you want to do camera, like operator or DP, not everybody that starts in camera becomes an operator or a DP. It's not you falling short. You understand? It's like those are the quarterback of those departments. And not everybody is the quarterback. There is a support team that is valuable and vital and fulfilled and doing their thing. And so, uh, you know, when I graduated, I thought I'm going to be a first AD. And obviously, I was well on my way uh, to doing that. And, you know, uh, at a certain point, um, and I spoke about it early in, in the panel this morning, you know, you kind of like are climbing this ladder and every rung of the ladder, you, you get above the clouds and you can see where you're going and what it's gonna take to get to the next rung. And so there was a certain point where I was in the, exactly the position I wanted to be in to take the next step, but that was when I could clearly see what that looked like. And I was like, wait a minute, you know, my, uh, my goals have changed. My, 
my target has moved and I don't care about being a first AD anymore. And I really, my goal was to work on big cool movies like the ones I work when I was, uh, I watched when I was a kid. And so, oh my God, like mission accomplished, I, I've done it. And so uh, to, to say I wanna be a career second AC or I wanna be a career second AD, that's not like, a cop out or anything like that, you know. Um, not everybody is the quarterback, and it's like totally fine. So, um, you know, and also the last thing that they said was uh, UPM, and so you guys should be aware that UPM is a DGA role, and that is what first ADs grow up to be if they take that next step up in the union. First ADs become UPMs, and it is. Not what a UPM hints here at the school, counting, uh, you know, uh, checks mix and uh, ordering lunches and stuff like that. Uh, you know, that's just like a very small part of it. In in our world, it's the boss of yeah. like everybody. They like sign your paycheck, so that's like the most important person uh, on the whole crew, the one that's that signs the your paycheck. And so, uh, you know, but that's that is a DGA role. That person was probably an AD for a number of years, and it makes sense that they now uh, have this position where if the key grip says, "I need seven thousand uh, four by floppies," the, the the UPM could say, "No, you don't. I did a show like that as an AD, and you don't need that." So it kind of makes sense. Um, cool. So uh, so there's the a, there's the PA route to getting into the union and then uh, you know there's other there's other routes and what I one I learned about when I was a student here at Full Sail is called the DGA training program okay and so um, you know there are two different and completely separate programs that have the same name and one is in New York and one is in LA and they are completely separate. They don't have anything to do with each other. They don't talk to each other. They don't like each other. And uh, you can apply for both, okay? And so, um, you know, that it is uh, quite a golden ticket, all right? And they maybe accept some like 10 to 20 applicants per year out of thousand applicants. So statistically speaking, there is not a great chance that it's gonna happen, okay? And so, but it is, you know, I was 30 when I graduated from Full Sail. And so the PA road can, how long did, has it uh, taken you? Took me, with COVID, it took four years. I would, without COVID, it would have been like three and a half. That's pretty meteoric, actually. Some PAs are PAs for seven, eight yeah. years yeah. of counting their days before they get in. And so I did not want to be like a 38-year-old PA. And so uh, I really um, went hard on the DGA training program, and I did my research, and I applied for it when I was still a student here at Full Sail. And at the time, there was like a written test which thank God has gone away, uh, but I had to fly myself to Chicago in December uh, and take this written test. And uh, you know, I, and there were some essays and I felt pretty good about it. And I got my letter and I got rejected the first year. And so, uh, you know, I moved out to LA and uh, the, the kind of third most popular way to get into the union is working as a non-union AD. Okay, and if you work as a non-union AD, and again, the days of work that you get have to meet specific requirements. So you better make sure you understand what those requirements are. Uh, and so I would, and it, but, but that's 400 days as a non-union AD, or at least it was 100 years ago when I was paying close attention. And so uh, that's, and I had non-union AD experience from Full Sail and from Orlando, and I felt like that was gonna be my ticket. Uh, and so I, uh, and I also, I didn't do networking good, so I didn't even have uh, contacts where I could work as a PA. These guys both got jobs because of Full Sail. And I didn't, I didn't do that right when I was here. So when I talk to you guys about it, it's like a cautionary tale because I did it wrong. And I, and I landed in LA with a thud and nothing going on. And uh, so I was applying to work as a non-union AD for like, $12 a day sometimes and pizza and IMDB credit. That's not a thing, guys. Like that does not really move the needle. IMDB credit, okay? So that people use that as like currency, but it's like, 
It, nobody cares really about that too much. And so I apply, but but I was working, uh, get move, getting it going in LA as a non-union AD, and I applied to the training program the second time, and I made it past the first step, past the second step, third step to the last step, which is a terrifying one-on-one -on -one interview with a group of ADs that make yeah, up the board say, of like directors. It's 15 on one. <laughs> right, 15 on one, right. And, uh, but, but I was, I was polished, I was all over it, I was confident, I was funny, I was charming, and so I got the letter and I got rejected again the second yeah. time. <laughs> and so, uh, but it's still, Still, I knew that getting into that program was going to be a major hookup for me. And so I continued working as a non-union AD and uh, applied the third time. And I, w I made it past the first step, the second step, the third step. I could have got disqualified even though it was my third time during any of those steps. Uh, but I made it to the final interview. As it turns out, I was the last person they interviewed, the last one on the last day. And so you might say, oh, there's no chance. They saw all these people. But don't ever, you know, it's up to you. It's what you bring to it. Don't, don't get defeated by circumstances that, and, and assign importance to circumstances like, oh, you know, it's COVID, whatever. You could still, you know, make it work. And so the third time uh, I got in and, you know, the rest is history. And I've never had to, like, even send a resume or anything since I got into that thing in 2002. And so obviously you can tell I have a lot of affection to it. And uh, um, uh, it's, the, it's the thing that brings me the most pride uh, of any accomplishment I've had in in production and so obviously I talk about it all the time and I mentor people every single year that want to apply for it and so Elizabeth uh, you know how many how long uh, were you working already when we did the application um, so yeah like that's a great point to bring up like you kept saying you were trying over and over again but at the same time you're collecting your days because there's absolutely no guarantee that you're gonna get a yes it, it, chances are you're not and um, and I was I was working in Atlanta I had started working in Atlanta already and I had been there for a couple of years uh, I had 200 days as a set PA I was collecting my days and working on my application towards the training program and uh, I had just gotten, gotten staffed. So I, I, I had additional days and I worked as an additional PA, what we call a day player, uh, for a whole year before I finally got my, you know, chance to like, you know, do walkies as a staff PA. Wait, and so how, how, how long were you working as an additional? One year. Okay, so guys, again, like, this is a kick-ass, successful person saying that's how long it took her. And so change. you better get ready like if you think you're gonna do it faster get on a staff job faster like why would you think that so uh, you know these conversations meeting successful grads it's all about you having realistic expectations and knowing what it's gonna take so you know there's no like shortcuts or fantasy uh, you get to skip all the steps so I love uh, I, I really want you guys to, to marinate in that and make sure that you understand that that's what it is. Yeah. And not to say, like, there's a lot of people that do get into these positions at once, whether if they're political hires and whatnot. Um, and it typically shows when you haven't been through those steps. A lot of people are not like that. A lot of people are like, oh, my God, this is my first day on set. I'm going to run first team. And, like, and they thrive in the occasion. I've met plenty of them that I keep hiring over and over. But, um, you know, the, the reality of the situation is that, you know, you want to learn as much as you can and get exposed to it so that when you do get that staff PA job, it's not your first and only one. It's, uh, it's so that you get hired again and again and again. You want to stay hire, hireable and relevant. Um, but so yeah, I, I had 200 days in total. I was on my second staff job as a PA. Um, it was the first season of Stargirl. Um, superhero show, we're working a lot of overnights and, and whatnot. And um, I was working with a team of like really graceful ADs. When I got the email that, hey, we want to get you to the next phase of the training program, like you're gonna come to the group assessment. Uh, it was really exciting and I went to the first CD and the key second and the second second and everybody, it's like, I'm sorry, but I have to leave for four days. And they were like, nope, take the whole week, go ahead, do your thing. And and it was it was really lovely. Like the, the thing that they told me was like, I hope you get it, but I hope you don't get it. <laughs> um, 
so yeah, I go, I go to LA, I fly myself out to LA for the first time. There was no test. It was just the essays that you, like the first step right now is like the essays that you submit online. They're sticklers about it. If you're looking into the training program, they will send your application back because of a comma that was misplaced or, or missing or something. It's like it, they're sticklers with paperwork. Makes sense. They're looking for ADs. They're looking for future ADs. What is a main characteristic? Attention to detail. So, you yeah. know, if you're applying for it, that's, they're looking at that. It's not even yeah. the contents of it, maybe even as much as can you follow directions. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah. Um, so, I, of course, like I sent in my application and they, it's usually at, in, at the end of fall that they mm -hmm. close it out. November, yeah. And then um, I get an email in April, I believe. I was working. Uh, my team lets me go. They let me have the week. I go to LA for the first time. I'm like, I'm traveling alone, and like, I just like, I just made it so that I would like have a good time, and also like, just kind of not build too many expectations about it, because of course it's like this guy. We had a coffee right before I went to LA, um, and he's like, okay, so like in the odd case that you get accepted in the first time, which is not going to happen, um, he said. Eh. <laughs> um, uh, he says, uh, are you ready to move? And I, and I was like, yeah, totally. And I was not. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I was definitely not. I had like this perfect plan that I was still going to beat Larry uh, by getting into my second time. And um, just like, you know, it, this was like my, my probe. It was like the, the moment that I was like, okay, this is what I did wrong. This is what I can do better. Like, da, da, da. I was like, I went into those group assessments and interviews with like that attitude of like, okay, like I'm just, I'm just here to see how the process is, to experience it for the first time, get as far as I can, and then collect my notes for the next year, and then I'll beat Larry. And, <laughs> um, and so, uh, you know, like I go there, I get to the group assessment, uh, it's like a very weird social experiment that they do. Uh, I'm not even gonna lie, it's a social experiment. It's, it's so, so weird, but um, you know, a good time. Uh, you can see what they're looking at, and of course we had a conversation about it, and this guy coached me uh, as much as he could, and um, that, that was definitely key into, uh, it's like we both got in, right? <laughs> yeah, I like that, yeah. I like that. <laughs> Um, and then, uh, yeah, so like a couple of days after that, they go like, okay, you're getting to the next phase. And I was like, oh gosh. And it's like, I call him again and I'm freaking out. Um, and so like, then we go to this interview, which is like 15 people and the room is not big enough for like 15 people. So the first person was there and the other person was there <laughs> and they're all attacking you with questions at the same time. And it's just like, it's so intimidating. The room is so clinical. The lighting is awful. Uh, it's like a very, very cold, um, again, another experiment on like resilience and like sounds like torture session you know holy <laughs> moly um <laughs> uh, but yeah um so it's good and then and then i get to go home and i go back home and i go back to my job and i don't hear from them until like a month or two later um i get a i get a phone call i'm i'm on set i'm still working on that show on star girl and i get a phone call from an 818 number and i missed it because i was working and it was a voicemail. It's like, hey, I'm so-and-so from like the training program. Like, just wanted to talk to you. Just call us back. And I'm like, I missed my shot. I missed it. I missed it. That's what happened. I'm like, I'm completely. And I was like, OK, whatever. No, it's fine. And they call lunch. I'm like, my head is not anywhere. They're like, Liz, are you OK? And I'm like, ah. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, and I start texting Larry. Larry, I think I messed it. I messed it up. I'm so sorry. <laughs> like, I messed it up. And then again, the A1A phone call comes around. And they call me and they go like, hey, um, so they said something. I don't know what it was. Um, and I go like, just just walk, walk me through it again. Do, are you telling me that I'm coming to LA and I got accepted in the program? And she's like, yeah, if, if, sh if you should accept the. <laughs> First time. If, yes. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Um, but who was your big. first call? This guy. <laughs> I, I, I pick up the phone. I'm here. still pick up, pick up, pick in up. like. I'm like, hey. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm like, pick up. Please pick up the phone. Please pick up the phone. Please pick up the phone. Because I will, I will pass out in here. And I go like, ah, ah, ah. and he's like, I'm here. I'm here. I'm here. What's going on? And I'm like, ah, ah, I'm going to Hollywood. <laughs> <laughs> like American Idol. Yes, exactly. Um, but yeah, no, it was a. It, 
it, it was a great time. I'm like, I'm still feeling jitters about it. It's like every time. I so when was, that it. was uh, 2016? 19. 2019, okay. Yeah. Who can, tell, who can keep track? Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, the, the training plan, once you, once you get in, uh, you know, that's it. You are assigned on shows and you get 400 days of on-the-job training and you and it's uh, the production that hires you uh, gets a uh, cheaper employee who is allowed to do the union responsibilities and the employee gets on the job training. So that's the kind of the trade off there. And so, uh, you know, usually uh, you're moved around and you do 50 day stints on each show. Uh, and so you move around, you meet a lot of people, you see so many different styles of working. You guys will see countless management styles, uh, some that, you know, are not great. And you can think to yourself, well, uh, I don't ever want to be like that. And then you'll get on another show and you'll be like, I don't ever want to be like that. And so you never, you don't get it to be on a show where you say, I don't want to learn what I don't want to be like anymore. You will continue to learn uh, yeah. that a lot. Uh, and, uh, and then you will find people that are cool and have good uh, attitude. And, that, and then you could say, okay, yeah, you can manage and not be like a screaming uh, complete jerk. Yeah, it's like, you know, and it sounds like, oh, piece of cake. And then from then on, my career just went straight up. Uh -huh. It's like, no. Yeah. Um, um, like, when, once again, I was couch surfing in Orlando here at some point. I moved to Atlanta. I was couch surfing. Um, I was not there. I was going to save up money. Like, I had, like, this getting accepted the second time plan for myself. Huh. And, uh, yeah, uh, that went out the board. Thankfully, I was in a month-to-month -month deal contract and I never bought like a bunch of furniture or anything like that. I did not settle in whatsoever. I love that place and I, you know, like I, I miss it sometimes and stuff, but I, it, it was a good place to be. I was not scared about not finding work or like I, I could have lived my entire career there and I still was not settled in physically. And then, you know, it comes time to move. So like I tell my landlord like da da da, okay, thank you, bye bye. And, um, and I go to LA, and then I crash on a couch there as well for another two months. <laughs> it's like at the beginning of every city. This I'm is like, the this is you know this is the commitment. This is this is you are really serious about doing this. This is I call you uh, the night before and say, can you work tomorrow? And you're in Orlando, and you don't say, well, I gotta drive. And you oh, didn't no. know, <laughs> right? And I didn't even know. You just say yes and make it happen. This is I'm comfortable. Uh, in Atlanta, when well, we need you to be in LA next week, you don't say, "Well, it would be tough," and I don't know. You gotta say, "Okay." You gotta kind of, I think, when you first starting out, especially, you know, kind of be nimble and be ready to make those moves. You know, you gotta, you know, you gotta say, "Well, you know, I don't have a place to live, but I'm gonna still make this happen." So you, uh, four years of set PA yep. staffing, uh, all the positions on I did set. everything but first team. Like, I did walkies for, I think, my first year and a half as a PA, which, like, I just did it because it's like, hey, it's work and it's experience. Like, yeah, walkies suck. That's going to be your first, like, staff job. Yeah, like, it's, it's a tough job. Nobody wants to do that position, but it's the first entry-level job. And it's like, you're gonna, if you're good at it, you're going to get asked to do it a million times. But hopefully, they allow you to move on up and, like, you know, move either their first team, background, you know, base camp, or, you know, eventually towards the end is going to be keying, you know, done every position like base camp and keying were like my last two things I did. I focused on background a lot because I'm like, hey, like, you know, that's the one thing I'm going to need to learn as an addition, like, you know, additional AD or second second is how to set background. Like, it's tough. It can be very difficult. It's like if one person goes at the wrong time, it can screw up everything that you set. It takes practice. Yeah. It really takes a lot of, you know, being in, involved with it to feel comfortable doing yeah. that. You know, when it's not just like your fellow students, it's like, you know, adults and old people and kids and dogs and whatever. You have to have real patience, too, because yeah. yeah. you're going to get some people that do not understand what you're telling them, all that stuff. So you get your days. Yeah. You uh, have documented your days. You got to put together a book. You got to send it to New York. Yeah. They look at all the days. How many is it? Through four? Uh, it's 600 five, days. Six, geez, 600 days. So 600 union PA days. And they look at every one. They look so at, how many yeah. did you submit? And I the first time I submitted six ten because I was like for sure because like I was like yeah I got it. But there was one show I was told that was a union show that was not that ended up being not a show. 
that qualify. You have to be under the basic agreement, I think. Yeah, and then yeah. So and how many they, days did that? They play? kicked back like ten, and I'm like, or like eleven. And so it was like put me right underneath. Oh my gosh! And they're like, sorry, we have to kick it back to you. I'm like, can't you hold on to it? Like I'm working on a show right now. I can send you like a call. She's like, no, that's just our policy. Like, oh man. And so I ended up submitting again the second time, 630 days. I'm like. I'm not screwing it up this time, like, you know, I making sure I get in. So it's it's there's like they're extremely like tough on that too. It's like if you don't do it exactly how the website asks or how they tell you when you call them, because like you have to call them before you put your book together. So like they'll yell at you if you don't call them before you put it together. And if it's not exactly like that, they will purposely either demark you days or like scream at you when they call you. So get ready to get, you know, some screaming. It's not fun, but. So when you uh, do your PA days like that, you get into the union in what's known as the third area. Third area means not LA, not New York. Everywhere else, Everywhere else. is considered third area. So, you know, there's more benchmarks that you have to hit yeah. if you wanted to work in LA. And the training program actually puts you on that list which is another really cool thing about the training program is that we are able to work in LA, which is a kind of a, a distinction, you know, because uh, it's already kind of saturated. And so they just can't say everybody can work in LA because there's already so many people in there that are, that are working. So um, how, what, what was your first uh, AD day? Uh, my first AD day was on the show called Will Trent. I got brought in as an additional AD. We had like hundred plus background and I was like, nervous as hell because I'm like, you know, making that step, like jump from pa to ADing is it's like, even though you, it's not like you've been doing this for four plus years, you're like, am I ready? Like, this is the true t testament. Like you're going to be tried and you know, all that stuff. Uh, but once I got on set, like it all went away. I'm like, okay, just do what you know, like you've been training for and like been learning, you know, all that stuff. And then you just fall into the habit. Like it's, it's natural. 630 days worth of yeah. experience. Man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's like, hopefully it's like, you know, if you're meant for it, you, you know, you're going to do fine. You know, you're going to mess up still. And that's what you're still learning. Like I'm a green AD now. Like it's like starting over again, like from starting as a PA, you don't know anything. And then once you start as an additional AD and get your stuff in, you're starting all over. I love it. So um, theoretically, we have seven minutes left. Allison has told me that there is not another session in here after. So we have a little bit of wiggle room. Anybody, everybody cool if we go over a little bit? Uh, all right, cool. You guys good? Anything yeah. Good? All right. Let's go. All right, they said we got to be out of here by 8.30 at the latest. So what? No? No. Much? All right. It's cool? Okay, good. 8.30. Thank Amazing. you. Amazing. Uh, so um, anybody have any questions? We can open it up. I saw Patrick's uh, hand first. Yeah. Um, we, are we going to bring the, you want to bring the mic or? Yeah. Okay, here comes the microphone. Thank you. Thank you. Um, really awesome story. Um, and I, I appreciate both of you guys coming out. Um, could you explain some of, uh, the experiences of, of some challenges that you've had on set? Oh, pick any show. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> pick any day. Uh, okay. So I got assigned to mythic quest. Uh, it was my first staff assignment as a DJ trainee. Um, and, um, you know, I I had worked as a uh, as a set PA doing wrangling background and doing walkie, so that was like a, kind of my thing. I wanted to get into base camp because I it's it's not so much a coveted job, but it's also a rare one. Like they don't really hand that to anybody, and it's like I need somebody to like give it to me first. And uh, um, I had maybe 40 days as a trainee, and they assigned me to it, and I'm gonna run background and. Um, and then uh, the base camp PA, they, for some reason, they decided that she was going to become cast there. Like, she, she was also, like, doing a few roles. She didn't want to PA anymore. Da-da-da. Comes the end of day one. I, you know, we run background for the first day. I'm like, okay, this is great. And I had told those ADs that I wanted to eventually base camp. So, like, if I could shadow her at some point, great. 
And then she moved on, like that, at the end of that first day, she's like, no, nah, I'm just gonna stand in and act whenever you want me to be in an episode. So day two, I'm running base camp now because I said I wanted to. And I was like, oh no, I didn't get the time to like call Larry and have him like explain the whole thing to me and the whole world. And like, I did not have like that cheat code or anything. So um, I really get thrown into it and I mean, Fortunately, I was lucky enough that the hair makeup uh, department heads were absolutely amazing, and they um, and they were out there to like train me and help and like just help me out and 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 correct me when I needed it. And you know, plenty of times I messed up so many times <laughs> because I didn't know what I was doing, um, and. Uh, uh, and they and they they were really great and they taught me but I really had to like learn how to do a job and like show up the next day at 4:30 in the morning not knowing the first thing about how to do this job, uh, so that was really intimidating. I don't know if that's a problem. Yeah, no, <laughs> but, and that's a, that is um, uh, you know it, you, you just can't just show up. You know, like you yeah. just can't show up. Like you have to do some preparation. You have to talk to somebody to you know prepare yourself, to calm your nerves, to feel better, to, to not be just walking into unknown. And so, I mean, if you, you really want to make that happen, but there are some times where you can't and you are just thrown onto the treadmill and it's, uh, it's, it's really hard. You, you feel like you never can get ahead. You're always behind. You're always playing catch up. And that is an unpleasant feeling. Yeah. Uh, so uh, you should try to avoid that. And you have the opportunity to by using your full sail family and finding people that have done the thing that you're trying to do and ask them, what should I expect? And then when you show up, you're not like just getting thrown uh, uh, everything at you and you don't know it's coming. And you can like kind of get out of the way of some things at least, but you're still going to get smashed in the face uh, by some things that you blindsided yeah. by. Yeah. And uh, that was that first day. It was like, this is a week before the shutdown because of that, you know, the pandemic, everybody. Oh, what happened? I didn't hear about that. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, 40 days and then we shut down. Um, that was kind of crazy. But uh, yeah, no, it was my first day uh, running base camp. The key second AD is up to here with like uh, craziness. We are just hearing about the this novel virus and whatever not. And so like we didn't know what to do, we were, you know, like at that point. Nobody. It, 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 it wasn't before, really a yeah. thing, uh, but you know, my first cast member was F. Marie Abraham. I kind of know we're winning. Oh man. And um, and so like, and everybody's like, you need to be careful. I mean, this is this is a legend, and he's he's he has this silly role on that show, and it's so funny. Um, and he's a sweetie pie, but you know, like it's intimidating. He has like one of those voices that you can't just keep resonating in your brain, and. Um, and I go, you know, like, and I go to him and it's like, I don't know, five in the morning and just like offer him breakfast, tell him to like, hair makeup is ready for you, da da da. And he's like, what's your name? And I'm like, shoot, I didn't introduce myself. Um, I'm Liz, hi. And um, he's like, Liz? Oh, okay, are you sick? <laughs> and I'm like, no, 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 sir, no, sir. Of course, you don't want to. Like, you don't want to be the person that's sick around the 80-year-old legend. Right. <laughs> that's you know. And I wasn't. I wasn't sick at all. He said, like, "Are you sick?" And I'm like, "No, sir." Oh, so that's how you sound. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's that's how I sound. We became old friends after that. But <laughs> it was like, you know, it's like one of those intimidating presences. So like, you're like, oh gosh. Um, but yeah. That, who that who else has a question? Uh, so the DJ, the DGA has changed a lot in the last couple of years. Would you say the barrier of entry is easier now or harder? And in addition to that, what are the DGA fees like? Uh, <laughs> still paying. It, yeah, it's they're still pretty expensive. It goes up every year, so it's like we get to deal with that. Like I think it's around like eight thousand now. If you, but they have payment what? plans, so it's like you know. You, you don't have to pay it all Seven. at once. Yeah. Um, but like, you know, it's the 600 days is still the 600 days is, you know, it's tough, but it's like, if you commit to it, you can grind it out. And like, as long as you're a hard worker, yeah. you're gonna get it done. 
You know, it's just about committing to it and actually like, completing the work and actually, if you, you know, knowing that you want AD. Because it's like you might get uh, like halfway through that point and be like, oh, this isn't for me. Like you end up getting good with like props people, grips, any of those people. And be like, oh, maybe I want to be a props assistant. And, you know, you make that change. And then you're going to join, you know, that union. So uh, the only thing that PA days count towards is AD. Yeah. And so if you don't want to be an AD, you know, you do not want to be a PA for very long. I would recommend everybody work as a set PA when you graduate, whether you want to do camera or lighting or makeup or whatever. That is your best perspective of what this is really like. So I recommend that everybody do it. But uh, what happens uh, to a lot of people, I think, is that they, uh, they, they start doing it, they start getting hired, and now you're kind of in this cycle of, well, I don't have anything else going on, and I keep getting hired as a PA. And so many PAs that kick the can way down the road decide you know, that it's really not for them, but they got nothing else going on, and so they become super bitter and lazy yeah. and unpleasant and bad at being a PA. Yeah, and, again, and, and that's going to be a lot of the people that you're working with. That's a lot yeah. of the people that we, uh, we hire. Uh, and so, you know, just if you don't want to be a, a, an AD, then don't be a PA for three years. You got to stop doing that and start, you know, moving in the direction that you want to go. Um, so it is still a, high, a really high barrier for, and it's hard to get in as an AD. Yeah. Now, um, you know, even when I got in, uh, you know, the DGA was mostly all old white guys, okay, let's not beat around the bush here, that, you know, Hollywood was an old boys club, that's, that's a fact, and so now there uh, is a lot of initiatives, and, uh, you know, we want to diversify, and of course we should want to, I always hire the most qualified candidate, I don't care, green, blue, purple, male, female, non-binary, whatever, I don't care, uh, I'm very proud that I, I surround myself with the best people, and I, and I, and I don't care, uh, but it is still, you know, the, the numbers are still really tilted towards dudes, you yeah. know, uh, and hopefully that's getting better and that's, that's changing. Um, I, I do want to point out, you know, obviously we're, we're talking about the AD category of the Directors Guild and, and how to get in. Obviously, we're not the only ones that are in it. Also, directors are in it, okay? It's named after them. So none of this applies to directors. And as a matter of fact, there is no requirement of any kind to get into the DGA as a director, except a DGA show hires you. And so, uh, you know, uh, if you ever hear somebody saying, well, I'm trying to get my days to be a director, they don't know what they're talking about. And they are saying a dumb thing. And everybody will know that they are dumb for saying that. <laughs> and 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 getting in the union is not what's preventing you from being a director. Yeah. Being good at directing is what is preventing you from being a director. And you're not good at it now because you're new and you're not good at playing the guitar and you're not good at riding a unicycle and juggling if you never did it before, if you've done it one time. And so don't worry about getting in the union, worry about practicing and getting good at it. Uh, but if you get in as a director, that's a separate category and you can't work as an AD. I'm in the AD category. If somebody wanted me to hire, to hire me as a director, I would be in both categories. Yeah. But Steven Spielberg can't work as an AD because he doesn't. He would have to go and get his 600 PA days. <laughs> <laughs> or get in the training program. <laughs> or get in the training program. Uh, so just please, please, before you open your mouth and say stuff, make sure that you know what you're talking about. And don't say something dumb. Yeah. Hi, it's great hearing from you guys, but... I wanted to ask, so I'm in my ninth month out of 29, and I just want to know what you think like, I should be doing if I wanted to join the DGA now as a student, as opposed to after I graduate or right before graduation. Like, What are the steps I should be taking? Uh, just get, you'd have to get on a union set as a PA, or start taking 80, like indie 80 jobs. So like, if there's anybody that's, it's gotta be a certain budget, but it's like if, you know, there's an indie feature or something up here of a certain bu that budget that meets that requirement and you get hired as that, like the first AD or, you know, second AD, you know, you'd be able to start count, knock it off days that way. Or like, you know, 
get on a union show as a PA. Like Florida still has, like, unfortunately, they don't have as much as they used to. But it's like, you know, they still have them every once in a while. So you're able to start getting that knocked out. It's like I had a few days before I graduated that helped out a little bit. And that also helped you network. So that way, if you do move to L.A. or Atlanta or wherever, that you can continue getting the ball rolling. Yeah, and I, you know, I wouldn't recommend that you, uh, you know, miss classes and stuff like that to start getting that experience now. I don't think that's a good trade-off. Like, you're here for your commitment to the academics. If you don't want to do that, then just go start getting your days now. You don't have to be here, really, okay? So, but if you are here, uh, then get the most of it while you're here and just focus on what you can get from full sale while you're here, making the most of it. I don't see a way where you start working on your DGA uh, membership while you're still a student here. Yeah. Just get all your ducks lined up so that as soon as you graduate, you can start doing it. But you know, it doesn't make sense to take like a month off and go work as a PA. You know what I mean? Like, why would you come back? Yeah. So just while you're here, just do, you know, get the value of full sale, which is you have the opportunity to leave with a uh, database of people that are working in the industry so that when you do graduate, you can really get some things lined up. Mm -hmm. Who else? Hey, Larry. Hey, what's up, bud? It's been a while. But yeah, no, I wanted to ask, um, I know y'all were talking about your struggles as far as after graduation and getting into like more work. I just wanted to ask if there was like any recommendations or what you would have done differently to set you further or what you'd recommend to other students. Any missteps or if you could go back? Uh, Did everything perfectly. Yeah. No, <laughs> no, I, 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 absolutely, definitely. Um, I think I fell short during my education here in like uh, honing my skills, coming to these events more and being more present in that way. And like, uh, you're pretty much the only person that I really, really talk to. Uh, and it's like, I don't know, I could have met so many more people and, and and make more connections and just have a base instead of like having that conversation with you a month before I uh, moved to Atlanta being like, I know nobody. I don't know anything about any anyone, you know, and I don't even have a lead or anything or anybody that, you know, that would house me. And it's like, and sure enough, a full cell grad uh, hosted me in their couch in Atlanta and again, I was lucky that Frank Jeremiah was listening to this conversation uh, across the aisle from us. But and then when I moved to LA, it was another full cell grad that uh, that hosted me in their couch for a couple months. Marina, love her. She's still out there. There's a, yeah. There's this culture of this place, and sometimes uh, you know students resist it. I don't know. Maybe it seems weird. Yeah, I don't want to drink the Kool Aid. Yeah. <laughs> but just. Submit, you know, it works. Everybody here just wants to help. It's really cool. I never heard of another school like that. And so just let it happen. Like, you know, it's, uh, it's the most important thing you can do. You can leave here with a giant database of people that know you. And don't ever walk into my office and say, I don't know anyone. You know, like you have your whole full sale family. So, you know, take advantage of that. How about you? Any, uh, I, I don't know if there's much like if I'd go back and like change anything about my like I felt like I got out of everything I wanted out of Full Sail. Like uh, I would say I'd go back and like maybe change up like actually like network out more for, like with different ADs. That way it wasn't like you know that way I'm not struggling like to like reach out to different ADs or like, you know because like that happened in, like my after my first year. It's like I only worked with the same AD group for about a year, and then well, I'm like oh I don't know anybody else and I'm like cool now I got to start all over again so it's like just networking it's like don't get stuck in like a group it's like yeah you may like lurking with that group but reach out to a lot of people that way you have a you know plethora of people that you could possibly work with because they're going to be different than how those that first group of people you know you work with this this networking component yeah it's a hard pill to swallow and some getting on set is fun and easy uh, you know but this other part is really uh, crucial, obviously. Anybody else? There's one here. Yep, one there. Hi. Hi, my name is Taylor. Whoa. Hi. Um, and I'm in the film BS. Um, and I just had a question. I was as during your days that you were PAing, did you ever have? Um, well, I'm sure you said you you made mistakes, right? That that you made those. Um, I thought 
what are some of the mistakes that you made that taught you valuable lessons going forward, like to help you keep going? Like that maybe it's something that you're like, oh, now I remember that. That's a that's a good one to know. Uh, for me, I would have to say it's like it just learning how to like properly answer like think before you answer because it's like at first like you're going to learn walkie etiquette as you go on like if you once you're like an additional pa and green pa you're not going to know how to answer the walkie it's like unless you like larry teaches you like he does i know he did when i was here a kind of walkie like walk over um but it's like you're going to learn that it's like watch what you say on the walkie you learn walkie etiquette and you know and then just have thick skin because it's like you're going to you're going to screw up a lot as long as you own up to it and like mm -hmm. continue, like don't make that mistake again, you're gonna be fine. Like we talked about, or Larry talked about this with the students earlier, or the grads earlier this morning. You know, it's like a small storm and it's like, if you go back to it, keep on going back to it, that's just gonna make them more mad later because it's like, they're gonna think about that. Just own up to it and move past it. It's like, don't do it again, learn from your mistake. It's like, if you accidentally wrap somebody like a backgrounder, the, you should have double checked before you did anything, but, She'd be like, you know, like, crap, I shouldn't have done that. Uh, I'm sorry. Let me call the casting and try to get these people back. Yeah, you're going to make mistakes. You got to be patient. Give yourself a break. You're new, all right? Everybody was new. Don't forget that when you're on set. Everybody there had a first day. Everybody there was green as Grogu's butt and, uh, you know, and made, the, and made mistakes too. And so give yourself a break. You can't be perfect at things when you first try them. And a lot of you guys get really frustrated about it. You want to be perfect when you first start out. And that's not unrealistic. Yeah, quit and so that. Make your mistake. <laughs> yeah, uh, take your lumps. Own up, to, own up to it, like Tim said. I mean, you know, like uh, pa Patrick Mahomes throws an interception for a touchdown in the Super Bowl. He's got to go out on the next play and forget it. Uh, you know, Ted Lasso says uh, the happiest animal on the planet is a goldfish because it's got a 10-second memory. So be a goldfish. You made that big mistake. You got yelled at in front of everybody. I told you not to let anybody go through that door. Do I have to put somebody else there? Can you do it? Are you capable of doing this? That is not fun, okay? But you got to be a goldfish. And like 10 seconds later, if you, need, if you have a reason to walk up to that person and ask them something, you can't be all like, whoa, sheepish and hunched over like a snail. You know, if you have, if 10, 30 seconds later, if you have to walk up to that person and ask them, you know, it's a, that it's a test, not that you messed up, but how do you respond after you messed up? That's that's the test, not that you made the mistake. How do you respond? And so if you walk up to me 30 seconds after I ripped you a new one and you got your shoulders back and your chin up and you look me in the eye and say, hey, question for you. Later on, we're supposed to move out to the back lot, blah, blah, blah. You, you know, that's that's what you got to do. You kind of like just got to brush it off, but you're going to make mistakes. Yeah, no, no one here is safe from yeah. from those. Well, once. Yeah, yeah you you guys been screamed at before on set ever? Plenty of times. Uh -huh. Ever been Plenty of times. on set? Oh, so, yeah. So, on set, yeah. on channel one, yeah. on the phone. <laughs> at the same time. Like, the same time. I'm like, how? Oh, gosh. Yeah. And so, you know, I had these awesome uh, three grads this morning. And so that's the takeaway. Like, if you do everything right and you're on top of it and you're experiencing success at a level that, I mean, between these two and the other three this morning, I mean, th these are like top one percentile of film grads. You guys understand that, right? The, the five grads that have been here today, as far as their level of employment and the, the, the echelon of things that they're working on, that is not common, okay? And so this is like the, the cream of the crop, yet all of them uh, have gotten ripped, okay? I've been ripped so many new ones that when the wind blows the right way, it sounds like a flute, you know, like a pan flute or something yep. like that. Even me, if you can believe that. Oh, I believe it. Yeah. I was there one time. Yeah. Oh, God. Oh, my God. Oh, man. Across okay. from the it's theater. It's okay. Move past it. Uh, uh, and across from the theater at like 4 in the morning, <laughs> yeah. 20 degrees, and Matthew Dunn gets everybody and says... All the BAs. So all everybody. the BAs. He says something to the effect of... And he's this really angry English guy. And just like something to the effect of, if you don't want to be here... F off. Like, that's what he said to everybody. Yeah. Looking at me. Yeah. You're the second AD. Oh, man. I have oh, yeah. PTSD from that. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right, Larry, we have one last question right over here from Stefan. Go ahead. Okay. Woo. Okay, hello. Um, I'm a veteran, and um, I lost a partial hearing in the military. So uh, 
I guess my question is, do you guys run into anyone in the industry who has that, you know, that problem, who is an AD or director, and how did they function? And yeah, basically, how did they function? I've known a couple of people with some hearing deficiency, uh, either on one side or, or the other. Um, they, I mean, one of them, she um, she wears uh, a device that helps her with the hearing, and then she wears her headset on the other one that works better. Uh, and she didn't like that. She thought she was hearing too much. Um, so they have adjusted. I, I it's uh, like I, I've, I've seen it more than once. You know, and uh, it's like, oh, like sometimes I'll I'll get introduced to a first city, and right before I, it's like, oh, talk to him on this side or something. It's it's not it's not uncommon. Um, you know, I, I I can't speak to their personal experiences and their day to day and how do they go about it, but um, but it's it's there. Yeah, it's present. I like. Like you said, I I haven't personally had any experience like that other than like, hey, they you know a little bit harder of hearing, hearing like you know talking like this year, especially just like with the headsets, you know, certain eighties you know tune it tune out the other ear, so it's like yeah, you might have to go and talk into the ear that they have their headset in on because that's what they're used to hearing like you know people talk like into, but like you know. Most of them, anybody that did, like any special effects guys that I know on set that do have hearing issues because of loud explosions, they adapt and, you know, they just crank their walkies up super loud. Yeah. You know, as can, a, we, sorry, go ahead. as a veteran, you have you already know how to do this job. I feel like <laughs> it's it's already there. You have you know the chain of command, the the organization, the um, the leadership skills, and and everything that you can take with you. You're like a really strong candidate. For Let's get you a um, a surveillance headset and see if, you know, if it's an issue. You know, maybe it's it's not it's it's okay. You know, but let's get uh, let's get you on a walkie. You know, come see me in my office. I'll get you a surveillance headset and we'll see. And then uh, the other thing, I mean, any issue like that, that's when I put my research in motion and find somebody else that has firsthand experience, and you could do that, and they would love to talk to you. Uh, you know, you've heard, you guys have heard me say it a million times. A candle loses nothing from lighting another candle. That's kind of like the full sale uh, culture, and there is uh, this culture in the film industry of mentorship. If you approach people with respect and deference, people are very proud of the jobs that they hold and how hard it was to get those jobs, and sometimes uh, you know, new people uh, have an arrogant attitude, like, tell me the shortcut. So you got to make sure your approach kind of reflects the fact that you know there is no shortcut. And uh, But you could probably find somebody with hearing loss uh, that's working on set and ask them, what's it like? And what have you had to do to make it work? And then you that is... Uh, how you enlist mentors when you specifically find somebody and say, hey, you, uh, you, know, you have the same situation that I do and I'm looking for some help. That is like networking one-on-one. And that's not you asking for like a favor or for something. It's just asking, can you share your experience with me? And that is how you should go about networking. You're not going to ask somebody for something. If they just met you, that's inappropriate. Like at the end of meeting somebody for the first time, you say, all right, cool. Well, can I have a job? Like that is really inappropriate. I don't know you. We met one time. You could be complete psycho. I'm not even sure. And so, uh, you know, um, when, but when you're asking them about their experience as it relates to something that you're going through, that's just perfect. And people love talking about themselves. Look at me every month. You guys know. So anyway. Cool. Uh, one more thing with that. There are also, like, once you try out like a surveillance, there are different earpieces that fit on most surveillances. So it's like you might be able to, like, if, if you don't like the initial, like, piece that comes with it and that doesn't work. Nobody likes that. Yeah, that, that piece nope. is garbage. Uh, you can go on Amazon and, like, there's molded ones that you can get molded to your ear. There's, you know, like, even more expensive ones that, you know, go deeper in and, like, actually are, like, fitted for your ear particularly. Awesome. Well, guys, thank you so much. And especially thanks to Elizabeth Rios, thank you. Tim Hofius. Guys, thank, thank you. Thank you, guys.